<clears throat> it's good to be at the house of the Lord. It's good to be in Ohio. And uh, good to be back with God's people here. We are thankful for the opportunity to be with you, brethren, and appreciate the uh, and value the trust that you have placed in us to come and in our feeble way share a portion of God's Word. And uh, we trust this uh, week as we uh, go through this series of gospel meetings that we can uh, worship together, that we can send heavenward a spiritual sacrifice, and that the Lord will be pleased with what we send to Him, and that we can each of us uh, uh, draw closer to Him. Uh, I'm thankful for the presence of each one. I appreciate your interest. I especially uh, appreciate the presence of the good Lord. And uh, each time that we assemble to worship in spirit and according to truth, that's something, uh, of course, that we always keep before us. We always have this very special guest. And it just causes us, uh, I think, to uh, see more importantly the value of the worship and the need for us to to prepare for worship. And I trust that each of us have prepared ourselves even before uh, we come to the house of the Lord and that we do this each time and that we are interested um, in, in things of a spiritual nature, that we can take our things, our minds off of the transitory and the passing and the fleeting things of this life and, and just dwell upon things of a spiritual nature. Heaven was interested in you and heaven was interested uh, in me heaven was interested in making a difference for fallen humanity who had become separated from God because of sin and of course that difference was made with the shed blood of God's own son our Savior Jesus Christ uh, he was called upon to make a difference for you and I and he willingly responded and if it had not been for that, the world's greatest love story, you could have as well stayed at home this evening. I could have stayed in the state of Tennessee, and we wouldn't even be interested in things in, like what we're involved in this evening. But heaven was interested, and heaven willingly responded for your sins and my sins. This afternoon, uh, sometimes it's hard for us to decide what... Uh, maybe to speak on as we begin a series of gospel meetings, but we wish to consider uh, the religion that surrounds this man who we have uh, ended our prayer in, uh, in his name and by his authority this evening, and also the one that we have sang about this afternoon, the one, the man that we know as Jesus Christ. You know, in the media, which travels... Uh, um, worldwide nowadays in seconds there seems to uh, be plenty of coverage that is given to the religions of men which oppose Jehovah God and which oppose his son our Savior Jesus Christ and if any press especially in mainstream media is given to Jesus Christ we usually find it in our in our times to be very distorted we, we find it to be of most of the time of a derogatory nature if it's in mainstream media. And so this afternoon, what, what can we, as we, as we begin our, our meeting this week, what can we know about the religion of Christ without any bias, without any ill will? This is our objective this afternoon. Religion is defined as an organized system of faith and worship it is defined as a personal set of religious beliefs and practices, also as a cause, a principle, a belief uh, held to with faith and ardor. And if, is one, if one is said to be religious, it is that relating or devoted uh, to the divine or that which is held to be of ultimate importance. Biblically speaking, when James wrote a pure religion in James 1 verse 27, he was describing what enters essentially into religion. He was encouraging 
you remember piety. And the phrase pure religion means that which is genuine. It means that which is sincere or that which is free from any uh, improper mixture. And you would not disagree this afternoon that we live in a, in a, in a world where religion is in a continual metamorphosis. It's in a continual metamorphosis. That, it, that is, that it is ever-changing. Uh, the causes, the principles, the beliefs that men hold to, they change. Uh, and regardless of what a man may choose uh, as his religion or belief, he can usually find someone to agree with him. Well, it is ever needful for us as members of the body of Christ to be reminded, I think, of basic foundational blocks that undergird the religion of Christianity that you and I are, are, are a part of. The devil is always seeking to annihilate pure religion. He is always at work. He's always trying to persuade men, women, and boys and girls to follow an improper mixture. And so our lesson that we present, we trust this evening, will be beneficial for us all. Some things that we can know about the religion of Christ. Don't have anything new off of the religious press wires at all. Just some things that we trust will help uh, just remind us, stir our minds up, and remind us of things that, that I think most all of us know about. This is not an exhaustive study upon this subject, but rather it is just a reminder of principles which every Christian must believe and must uh, hold to and must follow in order to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. Number one this afternoon, the religion of Christ had its origin, and I think this is impressive. This, this first point that we start with, the religion of Jesus Christ had its origin in the mind of God. It had its origin in the mind of God. Notice in the, what the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, first of all, beginning with verse 1 and reading through verse 4. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him, notice, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. All spiritual blessings come from God. And he has withheld none uh, from those in Christ. And where did this opportunity for all men to be saved eternally, where did it have its origin? In the mind of God. In the mind of God. John 3, verse 16, that familiar verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God was the originator of this plan for all men to be saved. Notice further in the book of Titus, in Titus the first chapter, Titus 1, verse 1 and 2, says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, notice verse 2, in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Paul's labor for the Lord was in hope of eternal life. And what about this hope? Listen, it was promised by God, God that cannot lie before the world began. And so the religion of Christ, my brethren and friends, had its origin in the mind of God, and it was purposed by him or formed by him before the world began. 
And that should be impressive to all humanity. It should be impressive to all humanity to think that God could look down through the ages of time, even before he created man, and see him in need of salvation, see him in need of help and refuge, and then form a means by which all men could be saved eternally. That brings us to our next point, point number two. The religion of Christ revolves around that very being, the Son of God. Notice the words of Peter in Acts, the fourth chapter, Acts, Acts 4, and notice there verse 10 through verse 12. Acts 4, verse 10 says, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. None other name but the name of Jesus of Nazareth. A man can be saved by none other. Notice in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians, the second chapter. Notice there Ephesians 2 beginning with verse 13. Ephesians 2 verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of petition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh, for through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And so the religion of Christ revolves around Jesus Christ himself being, the scripture says, the chief cornerstone. Further, look at Ephesians 3, and notice there verse 9 through verse 11. Ephesians 3, verse 9 says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here again, God had a plan, and God had a purpose, and the eternal purpose for the salvation of you, and the salvation of me, and the salvation of every man, woman, boy, and girl, was through his only begotten son. Not Mary, the mother of Jesus. Not some man-made God or goddess. This man walked among men. He lived a perfect life without sin. And then he went to the cross and he shed his blood and he laid down his life for all men. Paul wrote in Philippians, the second chapter in Philippians 2, Notice there, Philippians 2, beginning with verse 5. Philippians 2, verse 5, Paul wrote, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. <laughs> Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, 
and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yes, the, the religion of Christianity, the religion that you are a part of and that I am a part of revolves around Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. Now here's something else. <clears throat> the religion of Christ demands belief in Christ as the Son of God. In John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. <laughs> Jesus was the Messiah. He was the one who came to save his people from their sins. My brethren and friends, he was more than just a good man who walked upon the earth. He was the Son of God. John declares in 1 John 4, beginning with verse 8, he says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested, or revealed, the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Do you believe that? I do. I believe what we just read. You, you, you trust I believe that also. However, do you know and understand that there are religions in this world, many of them, in fact, that do not believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. But notice John's record in 1 John 5, verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is where? Is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the of the Son of God. A basic, fundamental block that undergirds Christianity, our true religion, is the belief and the acceptance that Jesus Christ was and that He is the Son of God. He has came to earth. He has died for our sins. 1 John 5, verse 20 and we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And so there he is. And John identifies his glory and he identifies his honor and he identifies his position. Fourthly, this afternoon, the religion of Christ honors God. It honors Jehovah God. Jesus Christ honored his heavenly Father, and he gave no honor to the gods or the goddesses of men. In John 5, verse 30, Jesus said, I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. In John 6, in verse 38, again he declared, for he said, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that hath sent me. Jesus honored his heavenly Father. He honored Jehovah God. And if we as fleshly man expect to reach God in prayer, we must go through his Son. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, the scripture records that there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. And who is that? The man Christ Jesus. The religion of 
Christ believes in Jehovah God and honors Him only. The Apostle Paul, one who embraced the, the religion of Christ that we speak of, spoke of Him this way in Acts the 17th chapter. Notice there in Acts 17, beginning there with verse 24. Acts 17 verse 24 says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Paul sought to teach and to convert those given to idolatry. He was here in the city of Athens, a city that was, was, uh, was wholly given to idolatry. Perhaps we today could describe our world around us in, in, in many ways as, as a culture that is almost wholly given to idolatry. Well, let us not be ashamed to lift up and to proclaim allegiance to Jehovah God. Let us encourage our religious friends to, to put away the gods, the relics, the, the remnants of paganism that have a strong and ever-growing hold on religion in our world and upon sometimes even those maybe who are professed Christians. The religion of Christ honors God, honors Jehovah God and Him only. Now here's something else. The religion of Christ is based upon truth. It's based upon truth. The Apostle Paul in Galatians 3 and verse 1 asked of the Galatian brethren, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? The Galatian brethren had failed to obey the truth. Notice John's record of the words of Jesus in John the 8th chapter. In John 8, 31 and verse 32, he said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, what is truth? As used in Galatians 3 and as used in John 8, and verse 32. Well, Jesus answers in John 17 and verse 17. He says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the word is truth. The religion of Christ is is based upon truth. And, and what did Christ say in John 8 and verse 31? He said, continue in my word. And what would it make? It would make disciples. And what would you know? You would know the truth. And what shall it make you? It shall make you free. Free from what? Free from the bondage of sin. Free from the decaying and the soul-corrupting yoke which... Satan imposes upon us as long as we fail to allow the word of God to work in our lives. Jesus in John 8 verse 36 said, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So the religion of Christ is based upon the truth. In the sixth place this afternoon, we can know that the religion of Christ has the truth or the gospel of Christ or the word of God as its creed. In Romans, the first chapter, Romans 1 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul wrote this in Romans 1 verse 16. He said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now Paul was ready to preach the gospel in Rome. And here we have a city, the city of Rome, that we might describe as the, 
the very stronghold of heathen pride and power. If there was ever any place uh, that one would be ashamed of a crucified Savior, that place was Rome during the, the reign of Nero. Nero was a known persecutor of, of Christians. And, but, but Paul looked forward to going to, to Rome to preach the gospel of Christ. Now, what is the gospel of Christ? And what does it proclaim? Well, it proclaims that salvation is not through the old law, by works of that law, but rather through the gospel of Christ accepted by faith. Again, Paul said, verse 16, Romans 1, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein, therein what? Therein the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so the righteousness of God the righteousness which brings justification in the sight of God does not come from legal works, but comes from God who gives the righteousness to those who believe upon and who accept His Son. So the religion of Christ has the gospel of Christ as its creed, and it must be accepted, and it must be obeyed. Now, when the gospel of Christ is believed, and when it is obeyed, and when it is accepted as man's rule or creed to follow, here is what man can expect. The religion of Christ, when followed, number seven, if you're keeping notes, will bring peace, and it will bring stability, and it will bring harmony, and it will bring refuge to all life relationships. God is not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. Not in the assemblies of the church and not in life. When men live according to the gospel, it fosters peace and it fosters order. Paul wrote to young Timothy in 2 Timothy, the third chapter. Notice there in 2 Timothy 3, 2 Timothy 3, verse 14, he wrote, he says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Teachers are preachers. Parents are children. Husband or wife. Male or female. When we take the Holy Scriptures and abide by their teachings... Listen, we can be fully equipped. We can be fully equipped to face life and overcome the God of this world. We notice in the book of 2 Peter, in 2 Peter, the first chapter, 2 Peter 1, beginning with verse 1, says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of, and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. There is a fellowship with Christ that comes from, number one, a knowledge of His Word, and number two, obedience to His will or obedience to that Word. God has granted us all things needful to live godly lives, lives that are full of genuine love and trust and purity. But how does such come? It comes through the knowledge of God 
the knowledge of his word. His word teaches us that we must change masters. The devil can't be our master and we expect fellowship with God. We notice in 2 Peter 1 again, verse 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. To escape sin and corruption, we must say yes to godly living, to ways that are right, to ways that are good. And this brings us to see that number eight this afternoon. The religion of Christ is void of lies, it's void of deceit, it's void of myths, it's void of all falsehood. We get a clear picture of how Jesus Christ feels about all falsehood in the book of John, in John the 8th chapter. And in his discourse there with the Pharisees, Jesus said there in John the 8th chapter in verse 44, he said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. Of the devil, he said, he was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Jesus spoke of the devil, the father of lies. <clears throat> Jesus dealt in the truth. He did not deal in lies. He did not deal in white lies. He did not deal in little lies. He dealt in that which was true. He dealt in that which was truthful. Now, a lie is an untrue statement made with intent to deceive. Deceit is defined as misleading or deceptive. A myth is an imaginary or unverifiable person or thing. A falsehood is a lie or that in which there is the absence of truth or accuracy. Lies, deceit, myths, Falsehood, such has absolutely, my brethren and friends, no kinship to the religion of Christ. None whatsoever. In fact, our minds are pointed in the opposite direction when we read such verses as Philippians, the fourth chapter, Philippians 4 and verse 8. Finally, brethren, Paul writes, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. No lie, no myth, no deceit, no falsehood. Putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Ephesians 4, verse 25. Lie not one to another, seeing that you've put off the old man with his deeds. Colossians 3, verse 9. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Revelation 21, verse 8. It's clear, is it not? The religion of Christ is void of lies, deceit, deception, false witness, Myths and all falsehood. Peter spoke of Christ as one who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. 1 Peter 2, verse 22. The Hebrew writer described Christ as one in, in Hebrews 4, verse 15, who in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So the religion of Christ, and I think this, this, is, this should be and again, I understand, we're just being reminded of these things. We're not sharing anything new. But it, it should continue to be impressive to us, and we should continue to, to show the blessing and the impressiveness of these things to our children, to, 
to undergird them, to stabilize them. The religion of Christ revolves around a man who walked and lived upon the earth a perfect, sinless life. And folks, men change. Men change. But the facts of the gospel and the facts that surround this man who we believe and know was the Son of God, these things are unchangeable. So, number nine this afternoon, the religion of Christ is without change. Hebrews 13 verse 8 records Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. The unchangeable Christ was the all in all. The Apostle Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, notice in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21 says, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. To those who obey the gospel call, whether Jews or Gentiles, the crucified Christ is found to be the power of God and the wisdom of God. And the gospel is uh, not only is found to be mighty, but it is found to be wise in meeting the wants of our old souls. It tells us of the world's greatest love story, the fact that Jesus Christ came to put away sin by the sacrifices of himself, and that in his death on the cross, he shed his blood as divine justice required, thus bearing our sins. And his message of man's need to seek him is not changing from generation to generation. And though the religions of men do change, they do rise and they do fall, they do embrace different creeds, the religion of Christ is without change. And here is something else that is becoming more odd and more strange. The religions of men seemingly swing with the tide of popular opinion. And popular opinion has made sin more acceptable. Even sins such as homosexuality or sodomy have become acceptable among many professed religionists Listen, the religion of Christ demands a life without sin. Notice the words of Jesus in Matthew, the seventh chapter. Matthew, the seventh chapter, notice there beginning with verse 17. Matthew 7, verse 17 says, Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The religion of Christ demands that men bear good fruit. The Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Romans, in Romans the 12th chapter. Notice what he wrote there in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There is such a thing as a good, acceptable, and holy life before God, and such a life does not include succumbing to the works of the flesh. 
Well, the religion of Christ demands that we lay aside sin, for as Paul wrote in Galatians 5, verse 17, you cannot do the things that you would. Well, we're talking about things that we can know about the religion of Christ. And by the things that we have this afternoon studied and considered, we can know that Jesus Christ should be looked upon with honor. We can know that He should be looked upon with reverence. We can know that He can, should be looked upon with adoration. The religion of Christ will teach men, will teach followers of Christ to remember Him, to even remember the death of Christ. When Jesus instituted His memorial supper, He did not lay a general course for men to follow, but rather He was specific in His instructions. Years later, the Apostle Paul, guided by inspiration, laid down the same course to follow. We notice in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, beginning with verse 23, he said, For I have received of the Lord that, also, that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Well, in the communion of the Lord's Supper, there is the remembrance of the death of Christ. The early church came together, according to Acts 20 and verse 7, on the first day of the week to break bread. And we today, likewise, we follow that example every first day of the week. And when we do, we remember the death of the Son of God. Well, as we said earlier, this is not an exhaustive study of the religion of Christ, but rather just some basic uh, foundational blocks that undergird true Christianity. And folks, uh, as I said, this is, this is nothing new. But do you know that just these basic things that we have talked about this afternoon, that they can become lost? They can become lost. And they are lost in the hearts of of many individuals in this world in which we live. The devil is good at what he does. And he can and he does lead men to spiritual blindness. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, 2 Corinthians 4 in verse 1. He wrote there, he said, See, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let us not be blinded by anything that would alter the glory and the grandeur that belongs to Christ and it belongs to the religion of Christ. Let us reject any uh, uh, allegiance uh, to traditions originated by the religions of men. True Christianity can and will be upheld upon the earth by the church that Jesus built. In Matthew 16 and verse 18, Jesus declared, I will build my church. And he accomplished that objective. And furthermore, that glorious institution, the church, which was purchased with the blood of Christ, shed at Calvary's cross, is to be, according to 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Are you a member of the church that Jesus built? 
if you are not, then friend, you need to be. The church that Jesus built is the only soul-saving institution known to man. And this afternoon, you can become a member of the church that Jesus built by, first of all, having faith. Faith that comes from hearing or reading God's Word and then believing God's Word to be the truth. You must believe that God is, that He exists, and that He is a rewarder of all those who diligently seek Him. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to, to please Him. Now, you can't stop here. Many would teach you that we are saved by faith alone. Well, in no place does the Bible say this. In fact, to the contrary, James teaches in James 2, verse 17, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. More is required than just having faith. Jesus, the mediator, gives us another step to salvation. In Luke 13, in verse 3, he says, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Repent means to turn. It is often defined as being sorry for sin and so sorry that we turn, that man turns from sin. In Acts 2, verse 38, when the folks asked what to do to be saved, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And so there must be repentance. And then thirdly, Jesus the mediator tells us something else that we must be willing to do to be saved. Hear him as he says in Matthew 10 and verse 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Paul says in Romans 10, verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so we must be willing to confess him before men on earth that he will confess us before the Father in heaven. We have an example, you know, of that confession being made in Acts 8, verse 36 and verse 37. It says, And as they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, here, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Friend, if you will take these steps, you are then subject to the final condition that the Bible says puts you into Christ, his body, the church. When the mediator, Jesus Christ, picked out his ambassadors, apostles, he told them to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. He promised, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, <clears throat> verse 15 and verse 16. The step of baptism is the only step that the Bible says puts you into Christ. Romans 6, verse 3. Galatians 3, verse 27. Baptism is the act by which we reach the cleansing blood of Christ. It is that blood that removes the sin that keeps us from God. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. And friend, if you will take these steps this afternoon in gospel obedience, the Lord will add you to the church that Jesus built. And then you can work, and then you can labor together with brothers and sisters in Christ to uphold true Christianity upon the earth. And so we bid you to take these steps this afternoon. If you're not a member of the church that Jesus built, the only soul-saving institution known to man, or perhaps you're present as a member of the Lord's church, and you realize that Christ has become lost in your life. An honest self-examination of your heart and the condition of your soul perhaps has revealed that you have drifted away from the path of right. If such is the case, would you confess your sin? Would you come and have prayer offered on your behalf? James 4 verse 16 urges us to confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. If you're subject to the gospel call to come to the safe harbor, then, then come and make your desires known this afternoon as we stand and as we sing the song of the